I'm John Mark Comer, and I choose truth over tribe. Are you tired of tribalism? I think a lot of what the left supports is satanic. The only time religious freedom is invoked is in the name of bigotry and discrimination. Are you exhausted by the culture war? If they don't like it here, they can leave. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Are you suspicious of those who say Jesus endorses their political party? Is it possible to be a good Christian and also be a member of the Republican Party? And the answer is absolutely not. From certainly a biblical standpoint, Christians could not vote Democratic. We trust the lamb, not the donkey or the elephant. This is the podcast that's too liberal for conservatives and too conservative for liberals. I'm Patrick Miller. And I'm Keith Simon. And we choose truth over tribe. Do you? The other day, someone asked me if I wear all black all the time because of John Mark Comer. And the answer is yes. In his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he unpacks spiritual disciplines which are designed to cultivate a Godward life. Now, many of these things are common, prayer, meditating on God's word, but many of them are ancient and virtually forgotten by modern evangelicals. One of those is simplicity, and that's why I wear all black. It means I own far less clothing, I make far fewer decisions, I don't go on shopping sprees. I mean, there's not too many black tees out there to buy, they're all pretty much the same. And that helps me focus my attention on God not how I look. Now, all of this might strike you as really strange. Why am I talking about this? Why was he talking about that? But you have to understand that John Mark is living in the least religious city in the United States, Portland. He planted a church there, Bridgetown Church, which has reached a lot of people. And through his work as a pastor and now as a teacher and a writer for Practicing the Way, He's come to understand that we as Christians, we have to get that our cultural moment is shaping us, and we have to be able to resist that and have practices that resist it. And one of the ways we do that is by cultivating biblical disciplines. Our enemies today aren't a military force or a political regime. What are they? Well, in John Mark's forthcoming book, Live Not By Lies, he answers that question. In this interview, we explore the cultural tectonic shifts which are making resistance to secularism and faithfulness to Jesus more challenging than ever before. We're going to hit the topics of what does evangelical mean in this current moment, and how do we think through the problem of celebrity culture and Christianity? We'll we'll actually look at the rise and fall of Mars Hill if you've been tracking with that podcast. Here's the deal. These conversations are incredibly important. Christians need to be having them. And John Mark is one of the best guides out there. So let's hop in. Thanks so much for being on the show today. It's an absolute joy. I love the heart behind this podcast. Happy to contribute. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just pumped to talk to you. Here's a, I'm sure at some point in your writing, you talked about how you started following Jesus, but I think I missed it because I think I've read all your books and, and I don't no, know the story. I, I don't think I have. Oh, yeah, okay. I, mean, I, I was so embarrassed to ask. It's like, I'm easy to be like, didn't you read it in this book? You said you had no. No, I mean, I don't have a dramatic story. Like, you know, I like you okay, let's just tell move on. stories if it's like <laughs> really dramatic, you know? No, my parents were both uh, first generation followers of Jesus, came to faith in the Jesus movement of California in the 1960s, 70s. My dad. Okay, so like like hippie Jesus. No, they weren't hippie. He was like, my dad played in a rock band, but like early Beatles rock band, like Uh matching suits and (laughs) uh, started doing, you know, music for soundtracks, stuff like that. And uh, like, you know, that kind of late 60s, early 70s Beatles. And he was playing in a rock band in California. And his girlfriend, I mean, full on invited him to a Billy Graham crusade in the Bay Area, went to the stadium just to be around the girl, sat in the back row, said he would never in a million years go for it. And then, quote, found myself walking down the aisle to receive Christ. Ended up playing drums at one of the first mega churches in America in Los Gatos, California, Los uh, Los Gatos Christian Church, which is where I grew up, and uh, and ended up becoming a pastor there. And so I just grew up in that ethos. And uh, Uh yeah, it's not dramatic. My parents long ago made a very firm decision to put parenting over ahead of pastoring in their priority list. So it was just very strong kind of family of origin. And there's never been a time that I can remember where I was not following Jesus. So, I mean, that's a story I think we all want for our own children. So 
I'll, I'll take no drama <laughs> in, in lots of people's lives. <laughs> so it's a little anticlimactic. Sorry. No. Well, no. It, it's actually really interesting. Notice your that your story is this I weird. To and I told the story of how my dad came to faith. Yeah, that's exactly that's right. You totally bypassed you know, you get it. Hippies, California, uh -huh. rock and roll, girlfriend. You know, you got all the things. Let me tell nothing. you my father's story. Well, it's fascinating because that's that is such an amalgam of uh, different aspects of evangelicalism. You've got you know a Billy Graham crusade, one of the yes. first mega churches. And so that's which is very much a part of my story, mm. getting saved into the evangelical megachurch movement. And but at the same time, spending my whole life in the Bay Area and then Portland, Oregon, on the West Coast, these super secular and sophisticated and progressive cultural contexts and navigating those two things. And, uh, you know, to cut a long story short, kind of jettisoning the evangelical framework while still holding to Christian orthodoxy, historic Christian orthodoxy. I'm very much an orthodox Christian. I'm not a progressive, but I don't know that I'm a conservative either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we always say. We're, we're, we're a little too liberal for the conservatives and too conservative for, for liberals. And, you know, part of the, I'm curious, you said you jettisoned evangelicalism. Do you mean that you jettisoned the political baggage of evangelicalism or do you mean something more by that? No, I think I mean more. I mean, again, these are non-biblical words, so you have to define them. Mm -hmm. And so I think my evolution was grew up evangelical, then for a long time, I would not identify as evangelical. But if other people were like, I would not self-identify that way because of all the cultural baggage. I think if you're a millennial, I mean, it's just, yeah. gosh, it's hard to have any good connotations behind that word at all. And uh, But if other people would call me that, I would not correct them because to say I'm not evangelical for a time there was to say I am a progressive mm -hmm. and I'm not. And so, but then I think with the election of, of President Trump or somewhere around that time, it just shifted farther and it became a full on political word. Like with that election, I remember that stat that went around 80% of white evangelicals voted for Trump. But then you when you actually looked at the data, 80 something percent of that 80% was not at all a part of a church, never attended church ever. Yeah. And so you're like, okay, so whatever that white evangelical is, is very different than <laughs> the majority white evangelical church that I grew up in because I grew up in a church is very different. So no, I don't have any loyalty to the label. It's not biblical. I think it's become a political pariah. Mm -hmm. But even at a theological, if you kind of rewind to the glory days of evangelicalism, let's say William Wilberforce to John Stott, and that kind of, you know, height of that movement, both are heroes of mine. But still, you know, um, the the only like kind of sort of agreed upon definition I know of evangelicalism is Babington's quadrilateral. If I said that right. <laughs> yeah. And which helped help me out, help me off the cuff. Remember, it it's was conversion. Basically, the, yeah, personal conversion, things, yeah. cruciformity, emphasis mm -hmm. on the on the cross and the and justification by grace through faith, that view mm -hmm. of atonement. Activism. Us, Social activism, yep. And then uh, uh, what was the fourth one? <laughs> see, evangelism, look at us maybe? Here. Yeah, so evangelism, there, there's, there's the evangelism. And I, no, no, it was, uh, it was biblical, yes. Inerrancy, biblical authority, yeah. yes. So I remember reading that and thinking, oh, I'm not an evangelical. Because okay, okay, which one? Not, not because I don't really agree with those things, more because if you were to ask me to summarize what's come to be called Christianity and four things. Those are probably not the four things I would pick. Okay. Pick your four um, things. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't even, I'm not smart enough to even. You're, you're telling me there's, there's, there, there's, there's not a John Mark <laughs> quadrilateral. <laughs> F Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can we do that? <laughs> All right, those are three Trinitarian. We can, we can go with that. No, it's interesting because uh, if, if you kind of trace where, where even your story starts with your dad going to a Billy Graham crusade to today where you have people uh, voting for Donald Trump who call themselves evangelicals and don't go to church, have, have no real uh, walk with Jesus in their life, seemingly. There's a big right. cultural shift that's happened. Yeah, you know, there was a recent Barna survey that found that 22% of millennial Christians have uh, left their walk with Jesus. And there's another 30% that still identifies Christian, but are no longer connected to a faith community. Another 38% yeah. that still attend church, you know, at least once a month, but kind of lack the core beliefs and practices of an intentional and engaged disciple. And then, you know, the 8%, last percent that's what you're coming for, right? <laughs> yeah. 
So you got you got you no keep keep, keep it coming. No, oh, yeah. Okay. So you got you got yeah. that final eight percent that are uh, what they call Barna calls resilient disciples, resilient followers yeah. of Jesus. Who you know these are people who would express trust in Jesus' sacrificial death for their sins, uh, the resurrection for the restoration. They express a desire to transform society through their faith, uh, and they attend church regularly. They have practices in their lives. But what's remarkable is that it is such a tiny. I mean, we're talking about twenty two percent have left their faith, and under ten percent. Are have a resilient faith. So I'm just am, curious. Am I am I right about this? That's not eight percent of millennials. That's eight percent of millennials who grew up in the church. Am yes, I that's correct. correct. That? That's correct. Yes. So it's not so it's not eight percent in general. Correct. Yes. It's a tiny fraction. Yeah. What's what's and happening? resilient disciples. I mean, these aren't like saints and martyrs. These are just serious Christians. Yeah. You the, know? the the church qualification was at least once a month. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, which is not exactly martyrdom, you know, so that's not to critique it. It's wonderful. I'm just saying yeah. 8% of millennials that grew up in church are serious followers of Jesus. That's, that's the data. And it's pretty similar, actually really interesting across, they did 26 nations. And that number is pretty similar, even in nations that are farther down the secularization trend like Australia or England oh, or Germany. Yeah. They still come up with about us that similar number of 8%. Now, is it different with non-Western countries? Uh, yes, it's higher actually. Hmm. So some of the highest, some of the highest rates of resilient disciples would be in like Singapore, Kenya, um, parts of Southeast Asia and Africa and South America. Yeah, it's fascinating. So most of our audience is American. So maybe we can talk about America specifically. But but what do you think is happening in America? Why are so few millennials uh, falling into this category of resilient disciples? Oh man, I mean that's that's I mean that's really the question of secularization, right? Which is like a, a murder mystery, you know. And I think it's like murder on the Orient Express, where who killed Christian faith in America? Everybody, you know, like. Uh, not killed it still alive but yeah. you know um who's responsible for secularism i mean gosh i mean where do you even start you got darwin you got the corruption of the church has played a massive role mm -hmm. you got hollywood you got foucault and the french postmodernists you got freud you have wealth you have post world war ii economic boom you have suburbia you have the pill you have the sexual revolution i mean there's so many different you know if the murder mystery thing but um yeah, i really feel I like i'm do. doing a clue game with you right now all right i know it was and the so, pill yeah, I, mean, I don't in the <laughs> i don't i don't know who i don't know what to say i know this that the great hope of the global church right now is young people of color around the world mm. and that the church is exploding in nigeria and kenya and china and you know singapore and more and more malaysia and brazil so i know that's a great hope for the future but i do think Part of what's happened in America, just to speak to what your podcast is about, is the politicization of everything. Leslie Newbegin, I'm, I would imagine, I don't, are you a fan, critic? I, I, I don't know I, I'm a of. Leslie Newbegin fan. Myself too. So for those listening, uh, I, he's a fun story. So Leslie Newbegin, I Well, you're, you're already blowing from, a lot of people's minds because his name's Leslie, and so they thought we were talking about him. And they're like, he, <laughs> may, could you share a little bit Sorry. about who he is he to, British. to introduce your audience? He's British. It's like... <laughs> He could be named Shannon or Leslie. Or <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, I mean, I could not quote from memory his like birth date and stuff, but yeah. he was a young Brit who became a missionary to India. I want to say he left England in the 1920s. Don't quote me there, but sometime before World War II, mm -hmm. was in India for decades, uh, was used of God in an extraordinary way, came back in, I mean, gosh, don't quote me, but I think in his 60s. And legendary story, he and his wife packed all of their belongings in two suitcases and took a bus home to England <laughs> from India. So he's that They'd kind of guy. They'd make a Netflix he's movie like, out of that today. Brilliant intellectual and like legit Jesus guy, yeah. like follower of Jesus. So anyway, he came back in you know the 60s and 70s and kind of had this fresh set of eyes to see the impact of World War II on England in particular and the West in general, and just how uh, it accelerated secularization and how, and his basic take was, listen, England is just as uh, non-Christian as India, where I just spent the last 30 years, mm -hmm. but yet we think about how to do church and gospel 
uh, evangelism and evangelical language, totally different in India or the developing world than we do back home in England or America. And so he, you know, is kind of the father in my mind of like the missional movement and learning to think intelligently about culture. He's very intelligent, very good writer. And his kind of prediction, or I think it was a prophecy really, was that as America and the West secularized, that religion would not go away, that instead it would be transferred over onto politics. And he warned of the rise of what he calls the political religions. And we are living through the fulfillment of that prophecy on the right and on the left. You know, one of the great challenges to me as a pastor, and again, I'm in Portland, so the over, and it's our church's majority millennials. So those stereotypes bear up to, you know, data points of research, but meaning it's just overwhelmingly left here. Yeah. But I grew up in cultures that were more right. And, you know, the great challenge as a pastor is that people's loyalty and allegiance seems to be to their political ideology of choice over the teachings of Jesus, the writings of the New Testament, and the historic Orthodox way of Christ. And um, it's a great challenge. So I think whenever the church plays chaplain to political ideology, and there's a, there's a right version of this that we're very familiar with right now, and there's a left version of this that we're also very familiar with right now, it radically compromises the church's witness and it turns people off to the beauty of Christ and the beauty of the gospel. And I think that compromise um, has, we, we've almost lost, that's not the only culprit, but I think like in the lineup of the suspects for, you know, who damaged the, the widespread kind of Christian faith in America, I think that's a key part of it. Hmm. No, I, I, th- I think you're spot on. Uh, bringing it back to people's personal experiences, as I talk to Christians today, uh, everybody I talk to feels embattled right now. I mean, whether they're on the yeah. right or they're on the left, they, they feel yep. this deep sense of being embattled. Something has changed, I would say, even in the last four years. And obviously, we've had a pandemic. So there's things that are happening outside of people's control. Um, but it seemed like 15 years ago, you might meet individual Christians who felt embattled in like a culture warrior type way, but they weren't necessarily the norm. You, you know plenty of Christians who didn't think that way. And these right. days, it seems like it's, it's most Christians I meet. They feel this deep sense of embattlement culturally. And so why do you think we feel that way? Where's this feeling of, of, of we're under fire, we're in the middle of a war coming from? Okay. Well, I would say there's a couple, I would say three things. One is the culture wars have ramped up to a like frenetic kind of pitch. Yeah. And so the war between right and left, we all feel. And part of that is because people no longer get their identity from a religious identity or a familial identity. And so now identity is based for the most part in politics and in identity politics. So their race and gender and such. And that just creates this kind of warring tribe against tribe, tribe coalition against a different tribal coalition. Yeah. And so I think if your perception is, it feels like we're living in a cultural war, that's, that's accurate. Sociologists argue that This is the most divided our nation has been since the Civil War. Hmm. Second reason, I would say, is the digital kind of moment we're in um, amplifies that tension to the nth degree. So I always have this experience where I'm like, if I never read the news (laughs) and I never went on social media, what would my view of America be? Probably pretty great. I've traveled a lot and I'm aware that America has a lot of problems, but on the scale, it's actually like pretty fantastic, (laughs) which is so unpopular. Even if I were to say that in front of my church, I'd probably get like nasty emails. All right. We'll we'll delete that one out of the podcast. We'll delete one that one out of the podcast. But if you've traveled, like a lot of times the the utopianism on the left is just like nostalgia on the right and utopianism on the left is just exhausting. I'm like, have you people never traveled or read a history book? And uh, so if I, if I didn't have the news and if I didn't have social media, I mean, it's it's great. It's summer right now. It's beautiful outside. I'm free. Yeah. I can walk around. I can get a, a hamburger or whatever, you know. But <laughs> hamburger, the, 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 the true watermark of freedom. The, the true watermark of greatness. Life is good. All right. We have access to hamburgers. Um, but then you pick up your phone or you read the news or you go online and it's everything's horrible. And this yeah. is the end of Western civilization and the climate, like everything's going to literally burn up and our species is going to die off and trees are going to inherit the earth and all this stuff. There's just like, because, you know, as much has been said about this, but 
the way Silicon Valley engineered so many mm -hmm. of these tools and apps, they're literally designed to magnify outrage, polarization, fear, paranoia, tribal thinking. It's a business catastrophizing. Strategy. It's a business strategy because our brain and evolutionary psychologists would say is wired to scan the horizon for threat. Mm -hmm. So the more threats you can put out there, you know, it doesn't mean that climate change isn't a real problem, but you know, you read the news and you think like five years from now, it's going to be blade runner and we're not going to be able to <laughs> breathe outside and we're all yeah. going to die off and human beings will be gone in 60 years. I mean, I'm reading the overstory right now, which run the Pulitzer prize, brilliant writing, but that's kind of the view. Like mm -hmm. you trees just have to hold on because humans are all going to kill each other off in like the next couple of decades. Like that's maybe a little bit extreme, maybe, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I'm, so I'm not saying climate change isn't a problem. I'm saying like the, the level that it's at, you know? So that's the second reason I just think is the digital echo chamber of outrage, fear, paranoia. Yeah. Well, and there's a there's an interesting author, Jeff Bilbro. He, he wrote a book about how we should think about news theologically. And he talked about uh, wow. the process uh, in England, how they would make roads, where we get our word tarmac from, is they take rocks and they would crunch them down into tiny little bits. And then they would pile them on top of each other to create a road. It's called macadamizing a road. And he talks about how reading headlines constantly having this constant stuff just firing at you left and right it macadamizes your brain it breaks your brain down into headline lengths and as a result uh it makes it easy for uh people who are propagandists people who uh want power to just run right over the top of you because you're not you're not thinking long enough thoughts to actually yes. engage with what they're saying you're just caught up in you're the in your limbic system yep. absolutely you're in that yeah you're in your limbic so that's exactly right you're 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 afraid you're terrified but you're gonna say a third some thing. of some of the most intelligent but yet calm and joyful people I know have switched to like a weekly news periodical, like The Economist, oh, where they'll just once a week, they'll sit down for two hours and read the news. And then they don't read any daily headlines at all. Oh, well, I I'm just like, read oh, Twitter for two I hours wonder. every day. It really helps me. In <laughs> yeah, walks exactly. Of Jesus. exactly. That's great. Twitter, Facebook, I mean, however, <laughs> it's just an accurate view of the world that uh -huh. calms your nervous system. Absolutely. Makes you just delight in the goodness of your life before God. <laughs> <laughs> and really just fills you with love for other people. <laughs> All know? of those things. That's why I do it every day. <laughs> it keeps me level. Makes us kind of feel like it's not us versus them. We're just kind of all in this together. You know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I say first reason is culture wars. Second is the digital amplification of the culture wars. But then the third, which is what the bulk of my book is speaking to, is in secularization we no longer have what ancient Christians called the three enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil to fight against. And ironically, when you erase this ancient Christian category and you think of the devil as a pre-modern myth from a pre-scientific age that foolish superstitious people used to believe in, like, yeah. you know, talking snakes and all that kind of nonsense. All the snakes talk in my garden. Ha, ha, ha. Exactly. And uh, don't you speak parcel tongue? Um, isn't that what speaking <laughs> That's tongues what I always is think of. This, this just shows what, who I am. I remember the first time I read that. I had read Harry Potter first. And I'm like, oh, it's like oh, parcel no. tongue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is Voldemort. He's right here. Permanently in raised a skeptical generation on yeah. a literal interpretation of Genesis. Yeah. You know, but same with the flesh in a Freudian kind of culture where everything's just about sensuality and feeling good in the moment. Body-based yeah. pleasure is kind of the new virtue. And then where the world is not even a category, once you erase those categories or just kind of pass them off as, you know, from the dustbin of ancient Christian history, ironically, you're not left with a world without struggle. You still feel this struggle deep in your stroll, soul. But instead of fighting against the world, the flesh and the devil, you end up fighting against Republicans or Democrats or this tribal group against that tribal group or this economic problem or that economic problem or your career or your coworker or your boss or whatever. And this is where Paul's, you know, language is more provocative than ever before. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. And what happens is when you don't believe in uh, demons, you end up demonizing other people or mm. entire groups of people. If you don't believe in an animating dark energy behind systemic evil, you end up thinking that politics and education will solve all of the world's problems. And then guess what? Politics and education don't solve all the world's problems. And so you have an entire generation that is freaking out on Twitter, you yeah. know? <laughs> so yeah. I think those are kind of three layers, I would say. Culture wars, digital amplification of culture wars, 
And then the misnaming of the struggle we all feel in our soul from the historic world, the flesh and the devil to a secular kind of man, our problem is just we need the right killer app, the right technology, science, the right person in office, the right political wealth redistribution. Mm -hmm. And they were good. Yeah. And it keeps not being good. It keeps not working. We, utopia keeps not arriving, you yeah. know. Yeah. In your book, you mentioned three different ways that the ground is shifting underneath us. I think you call them tectonic shifts. Uh, you talked about the move from majority to minority. I, I'm curious, yes. can, can you expand on that? What do you mean when you say that we've made a move as Christians from majority to minority? Yeah, I'm just talking about like the, you know, the shifts as far as the church's place in American or Western culture that yeah. in some sense date back to Voltaire and the American and French Revolution. You know, so it's not like it's a new thing. It's been happening for hundreds of years. But for a long time, these shifts were more located for elites. They didn't hit pop culture really till the 60s, I would say. So, you know, if you're somebody like me, I'm born in 1980. Even I have this different experience to being a Christian as a child than now. Like when I was a kid, Christians were weird. Um, you know, like we were the people that don't have premarital sex and we go to church on Sunday instead of camping or we were weird. Yeah. Um, and this was back when Christians used to go to church every week. Uh, <laughs> but now we're bad. Mm. We now have the moral low ground. Like yeah, so that's the second threat. thing you talk we're about the shift from honor to shame. Yes. So, so I named, yes, exactly. So I named three kind of shifts in the book, the majority of the minority, meaning the bulk of the population used to be quasi Christian. Yeah. Now we're down to, we don't, we don't have firm numbers, you know, and each city would be very different, but you know, the Barna study again, 8% of millennials that grew up in church and that's nationwide. Mm -hmm. So millennials in a city like Portland, like in general, I don't know what that number would be. I would imagine under 1%. Somebody said yesterday, uh, actually, who was actually preaching at our church at this great line. He's like, Jesus said, you know, we have to leave the 99 to go after the one, but in Portland, you have to leave the one to go after the 99, you know, <laughs> um, because you're and I'm not, again, I'm in the least, uh, Portland Pew research found that we're the least religious city in America. Yeah. So I'm maybe an extreme example of that, but majority to minority, we're now this tiny, you know, if you're in an office party, you know, in 1950, probably over half of those people would have at some level identified as Christian or Catholic or whatever. Yeah. Now, if you're in an office party with 100 people, maybe you're the only person there who's a follower mm -hmm. of Jesus. Um, second would be, yeah, from the center to the fringe, like Christians used to be at the center of culture making in D.C., in the arts, entertainment and science. I mean, I'm reading Dominion right now by Tom Holland. And basically, all elite intellectuals were Christians for like 1500 years for the most part. And Voltaire and a couple others like broke this mold and it was just shattering, you know, but like scientists, I mean, everybody was a Christian at some level. Yeah. And now we're kind of, people want nothing to do with faith in the public square. Christianity's fine. If it's a private therapeutic thing that you keep to yourself and you don't bother the rest of us with, but don't talk about it. Don't vote for it. Don't whatever. Just keep it to yourself off to the side. And then, yes, the third shift would be from a widespread kind of tolerance to a rising hostility from Christians are weird to Christians are bad. We now, in particular, with human sexuality and gender, we have the moral low ground in a lot of people's opinion, which means that the perception is Christians are a threat to equality, human dignity, freedom, as it's been, I think, redefined, but all that kind of stuff. And those those three shifts, that's a lot to handle emotionally. That's like really disorienting. Um, whether you're my age and you grew up and you remember a time when it wasn't like this as much, um, or unless if you were like in, you know, a, a smoky teacher's lounge at Harvard <laughs> or something, then maybe it felt that way, but yeah. not on Twitter and everything. And, and even if you grew up in it, it's just a hard, it's a hard place emotionally to kind of find yourself. Yeah. But it's nothing new. Christians have been here many times down through church history and they've found ways to thrive. Yeah, I, I do think to some degree it is new, at least to Americans and living memory. I was reading recently yes. that, you know, in the 1930s to 1940s, about 43 to 49% of Americans attended church regularly. And by 1960, that had spiked to 69%. So the vast yes. majority of Americans are attending church. And now we're going to the point where, at least among millennials, you're looking at somewhere in that, again, 10 percentage range of people who are regularly attending yes. church in our generation. Exactly. Those That's are massive. Huge pendulum swings. 70 to 10% in one generation mm -hmm. or two, depending on how you count. Yeah. Where, was that uh, Rodney Stark's book? What are you referring to? 
Uh, <laughs> I've been reading so much on this. I can't even cite my sources <laughs> anymore. No, no, it's okay. Well, there's this, there's this random book. I'm not recommending it. It's a very dry read, but academic book yeah. called the churching of America by the sociologist Rodney Stark. Mm -hmm. And he just does the sociological history of the church of America. It's very dry, but it blows up a lot of, uh, popular misconceptions. And one of the points that he makes that's actually really encouraging is that the most post-Christian America ever was, was at its founding. So he paints a picture of early America as Interesting. hyper secular, immoral, slavery is the norm, serious Christians are few and scandalous and often uh, tarred and tortured alive by the revolutionary army because they won't go to war against Rome because they believe it's unbiblical. I'm sorry, not a war against England because they think <laughs> what it's do unbiblical. you really think based about on, England <laughs> based on the early church, not going to war against Rome, you know? Yeah. And then argues that peak Christianization of America was 19, I think 62, I want to say is his mm -hmm. year. And he goes off things exactly like the church attendance. So we don't realize he basically argues America didn't become more of a quote Christian nation until the second great awakening when Christianity became more normative. Mm -hmm. And so if you like, but we're coming off the Zenith, like the 1950s, 60s was like the highest it ever was. And then to crash back down, <laughs> but it's actually encouraging because if it happened once it can happen again, Absolutely, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because the narrative is that for the last 500 years, you know, or at least a couple hundred years since Darwin, the, the world, the West has just been getting less and less Christian and more and more secular. But actually that doesn't, that hypothesis doesn't really stand up to a, a rigorous actually research project. And it's more like highs and lows and ups and downs, more like a wave. And so the thought was, man, if America was that more post-Christian than it is now at its founding, yeah. could we have another great renewal movement? Could there be a sweeping move of God? I don't know. We'll get back to my interview with John Mark in just one minute. If you're anything like me, these kinds of conversations make you self-reflective. You ask, maybe I've become tribal. Guess what? We've got something just for you. We have a free five-day tribalism detox. It'll be sent directly to your email. And we've got a detox program for people coming from the left and a different one for people coming from the right. It's designed to help you step away from your party allegiances. Not to take a step towards the other side, but to help you take a step towards King Jesus and his politics. Now let's hop back in my interview with John Mark. So I, I have a question, but back to this idea of tectonic shifts, because when you were describing these tectonic shifts that were happening to Christians, I was reading it and I thought, I, I have not heard anyone crystallize this so well. It's exactly what I'm experiencing. Uh, it's what I've seen happen in particular over the last five years, but it's been happening for a while. And I couldn't help but think about, uh, in 1994, I was reading about one of the biggest earthquakes that hit Los Angeles, which you, you might remember, I guess, since you were <laughs> in the relative area, but it was talking about how people responded in these wildly different Different ways. Like some people start running to churches because they don't think they're going to fall down. Other people are hiding under tables. Some people try to ignore it. Other people froze in place. And I just started thinking as, as these shifts are happening beneath our feet, mm -hmm. what are the responses that, that you're seeing people have? What are maybe start with some of the unhealthy responses that, that Christians are having to some of these changes? Uh, yeah, I mean, gosh, that's a great analogy as somebody that grew up in you know, the, the quake that I remember was the 1989 quake, okay. was one of the largest ones in recorded history, because right. I was a mile, I lived a mile from the fault line. No way. That's where like Candlestick Park, you know, yeah. all that stuff got, Bay Bridge, you know, collapsed, all that kind of stuff. That's why. So yeah. I, I remember that. I have this vivid memory. I was nine years old. I remember the earthquake. I remember mm -hmm. sleeping with my family for three days in the living room because of the aftershocks and broken glass windows breaking in our house and uh, the whole, you know city blocks destroyed by where we live. So yeah, that's a great, I think, word picture. I mean, I don't know, this is off the cuff. I mean, I think for sure two of the unhealthy, so there's two kind of <laughs> coexistent unhealthy responses that I see right now. One is what we've been talking about. People go to either political extreme, the right or the left. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, Statistically, to stereotype, the younger you are, the more likely you are to go left. The older you are, the more likely you are to go right. Although some argue that's shifting with Gen Z, that there's already a rebellion against the kind of totalitarian utopianism and digital Marxism of the internet. Hmm. Some argue that Gen Z actually could end up becoming really conservative. So that's interesting to see <laughs> if that happens. Yeah. Again, progressives don't think that because the progressive narrative is everybody's going to catch up to your intelligence but it turns out there are other intelligent people that disagree with you. And that's hard to fathom <laughs> if you're a progressive. Um, so 
So that's one clear example where people are just attempting to update their Christian faith to sit comfortably with the world as it is now on the left or the right. Again, my experience is mostly a left version of this, but I'm very aware that there's a massive, the problem is just as huge on the right. And that is just devastating. It's sad. And you rob you. If the way of Jesus, if your discipleship to Jesus doesn't have resistance and contrast built into the culture around you, Mm. um, it will evaporate and disappear. And so like, what's, what's the point of being a Christian if, you know, like, for example, in the progressive world where I live, you know, (laughs) the badge of honor for a progressive Christian is kind of, you can pass as a pagan. Like, that's kind of like, oh, cool. You're, you're a Christian, but I never would have known. And you're so open and tolerant and pagan and you're into the other things and awesome. That's like a badge of honor. Mm. But at that point, you're like, well, why become a Christian? You know, this is Larry Hurtado, the historian of early church Christianity that basically says, tries to answer, like, why would millions of people become followers of Jesus when they knew it was going to get them killed? It was a persecuted, you know, religious movement for 300 years. And he just talks about how it was it was precisely Christianity's difference and distinctiveness to the culture that made it so attractive and appealing, not its relevance or relatability. And that's what I think people on the left and the right don't realize. And so that's a very unhealthy response that I tragically see all of the time. People just kind of assimilating into the right or the left and adapting their Christianity, which tends to be like a stopover on the way to post-Christian, yeah. whether it's on the left or the right. The other uh, ironically coexistent unhealthy response that we don't see as much because it doesn't involve like really nasty comments on Instagram or mean tweets or protests or banners or slogans is just like what ancient Christians called like the noonday demon, this kind of acedia, they called it just this kind of late, like uh, lassitude and kind of just mind numbing yourself on Netflix and just disappearing into consumerism or video games or marijuana or busyness with soccer practice, or just kind of, you know, just having this kind of tepid faith that just kind of tunes out and man, I don't know, has Christianity going to survive the Western secular apocalypse? Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's watch walking dead on Netflix or whatever, or Hey, hey, (laughs) have you watched tiger King? (laughs) Have you, have you seen tiger King? I don't know. Let's just uh, pour more wine and let's have some chips and guac, you know? (laughs) And it's this kind of Hmm. just like, ah, I'm overwhelmed. Let me just disappear into entertainment and distraction. And really what I think we're trying to do is numb the pain. Hmm. I think, you know, um, whatever your cultural narcotic of choice is, whether it's a literal narcotic or alcohol or Netflix or social media or work or even church, um, you know, narcotics serve a powerful function. They help, they help us deal with pain and they can be really helpful for acute pain. Like, you know, I take ibuprofen when I stub my knee, I don't just pray. I take medicine, but they're not helpful when they have a root problem that you need to do surgery on and fix. Um, because then it's just making a bad problem worse. So I think those kind of equal opposite, you know, the outrage on political left or right response or the opposite of outrage, the noonday demon, the just kind of getting lost. Those are probably the most common things that I see right now. Yeah. You know, you're making me think of uh, Martin Luther. He talked about how humanity is like a drunk man that falls off a horse, tries to get back on and then falls off the other side. And it does seem like that's, <laughs> that's what happens to us so often, you know? We're just, that is so good. <laughs> he was funny. I want to hate Luther. Because I know. He said some terrible things. Kind of his theology. And, but he's just, he was absolutely brilliant. He was brilliantly funny. At the very uh, least. Yeah, I don't care what you think of him. You have to agree. Grabbing he a pint funny with, and he with was a mutilated. wicked smart. <laughs> I know. So, so h- h- how do we... Uh, how do we avoid that risk of falling off either side of this horse? What, what, what's the path forward for uh, followers of Jesus who want to say, you know what, I, I, I want to, on the one hand, care about society and what's happening in our culture, in our world. Uh, I, I want to care about justice and injustice. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, I want to care about uh, spiritual practices and, and my, my individual walk with Jesus. How, how do we merge all these things together? Well, I mean, gosh, I don't know if this is the answer you want from me, but go for it. I, I, read your I book. believe that. The, the, <laughs> yeah, no, read, buy my book and buy a copy for a friend. And I outline my 30 day plan to 
Um, no, I think the future is ancient. So I, I don't, I think we're, we're living in an analogous time to the fourth and fifth century, the decline of the Roman empire, heresy abounds in the church, the church church's mm -hmm. leaders have been corrupted by power on both sides of the culture war. The culture as a whole is decadent and falling into a slow decline. And I think our response must be somewhat similar to the serious Christians of the third and the fourth and the fifth century, which is where you have the desert fathers and mothers, you have monasticism, you have new religious movements, you mm -hmm. have a new devotion to prayer. You have what they call the, uh, the 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 white martyrs and the green martyrs where people were no longer being martyred for their faith because the way of jesus had been legalized now the opposite problem was compromise and complicity in the empire um and so they developed what they called the the, the green martyrs people that would go off into the forest of ireland and just pray and they, they would die to a normal life to devote their life to prayer the white martyrs which were basically early missionaries that would get in these random Celtic boats and let the winds carry them, which I would never do. It's not even in my theological paradigm at all, but God used Okay. So I've got to in get into a ways. boat, go out into the ocean yes, and who with knows? No oars and just see where God takes you. Yeah. Like, seriously, we laugh, but like that was their level of surrender to God, whether that was misguided theologically or not, that was their level of surrender. I mean, gosh, that's admirable. So I think the future is ancient and it's, it's simple. The world is complex. So I don't mean like that in an unsophisticated way. But it's simple in that, and this is why so many people don't talk about it, because there's no way to make money off of this or to popularize yourself with it. But it's following Jesus together in community based on his life teachings in the New Testament. Mm. You know, Dallas Willard, philosopher of universe, from the University of Southern California and a hero of mine, I think he was like a modern day saint. I think if he had been Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, he would be like in the running for canonization right now. And um, he has this provocative line that I disagreed with the first time I read it, but then I've had to think about it a lot since. He says, there is no problem for which discipleship to Jesus is not the ultimate solution. Hmm. And um, I'm sure lots of people are hearing that. And like me, your initial reaction is, yeah, no, that's easy for you as a white guy. You don't care about justice or da, da, da. And maybe you're interpreting that as some private retreat into religious experience or something. But the longer I've sat with that, the more, like a lot of Willard's things, I disagree at first. And then I come to realize it's brilliant and right. There is no problem either for our nation, whether it's issues of justice or equality um, or for the church, whether it's issues of compromise or complicity with the left or the right or the abuse of power or the neglect of power, or for our own life and our own self-defeating behavior and lack of love and egocentricity and fear-based lifestyle and all the ways that we live that negate love, um, there is no problem for which discipleship to Jesus is not the ultimate answer. So I, I just think, I think Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to human history. I think most of the best things in the world today are all the direct or indirect result of his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, yeah. and the community that he founded. And I think uh, until his return, no community, no nation, no people, no person will ever live up to Jesus' over-the-top compelling vision of life in the kingdom. But I think it's living in pursuit of that where life is found. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm reflecting as you talk, it seems like evangelicalism or whatever we want to call it, well, yeah. it's absorbed uh, so many different cultural ideas, whether it's how we think about power and uh, what the good life is or cultural practices, how we live our lives. And, you know, it makes me wonder if as difficult as this time is, the shifting that's happening, if it's really a purging fire and that God's going to use it to uh, draw people to himself and people, you know, the part of a fire people don't like is the, is the burning off, but I've experienced in my own right. life that I, there's parts of me that have to get burned off in yes. this process. And so I, I think what you're saying is really profound and it would be my prayer that, uh, people would look to Jesus and discipleship as the answer. Yeah. Um, changing topics really quick. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do a complete about face. So I apologize. You'd be like, what? How did no. we get here? Hey, it's your podcast. You don't apologize. <laughs> well, Just along for the ride. Yeah. So let me ask you, I, I, I don't want to assume, have you been listening to uh, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, Mike Cosper's podcast with Christian? Oh today? my gosh. Yeah. I like, I am not a serial podcast listener. I don't have much of a commute. And so yeah. it's like, I don't even have great. And yes, I like 
can't <laughs> stop listening. I'm all cut up. Yeah, I, I, me too. It's, 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 I, I think it's one of the best podcasts of this year. There, there's a few that I've got on my favorite list, but it, they've done a spectacular job. And one of the things that he traces is the development or kind of the lineage of celebrity pastors. And so I was just talking about evangelicalism has absorbed a lot of culture. And I think one of the things we absorbed was this uh, celebrity obsession and that Mark Driscoll is very much so in line with the uh, celebrity pastor model. And it's what enabled a lot of his abuses to be covered up and, and hidden and uh, all that. Now, I, I'm curious, obviously, over the last few years, you've gone through a personal shift where you have a lot more name recognition. I'm sure some people would call you, even though you're not pastoring anymore, a celebrity pastor. Uh, how have you thought about that in your own life? I mean, do, do you fear about celebrity causing you know irrevocable life <laughs> damage? How are you kind of resisting that change for yourself? Yeah, I mean, first off, it's really sobering and listening to that podcast, especially, you know, being in Portland, we planted in 2003, I think they planted Mars Hill and I want to say 96. Is that right? Something like uh -huh. that. Yeah. So when we planted, they were kind of like the cool church in the Pacific Northwest. You'd hear their name a lot. They weren't big. They didn't get big for many years later, but you'd hear a lot and just extraordinary. So I lived through that Mars Hill planted in Portland, yeah. a bunch of the people on that podcast I'm friends with and are from our city. It's sobering. And yes, I've given a lot of thought to it. And I'm not sure that I have clean, neat answers that don't involve a healthy dose of the fear of God. Hmm. I do think we have to distinguish, distinguish between celebrity that's the result of projection and celebrity that's the result of promotion. So there's a kind of celebrity that we project onto our heroes. So Dallas Willard, the farthest thing from a Christian celebrity you can imagine, I never got the chance to meet him. If I did, I'm sure I would have been a little trembly in my <laughs> nervous system and like wanted to take a picture with him. I remember I had to, got to have breakfast years ago with N.T. Wright, and I just was like fanboyed <laughs> to the nth degree, you know? And that was all projection. That was, I mean, like, you know, he was wonderful and down to earth and had breakfast with some random guy on a book, on a tour he was on. Um, so there's that kind. And then there's the celebrity that's the result of, of promotion where you have intentionally designed a digital marketing apparatus or in, you know, Mars Hill's case, a very <laughs> visible marketing apparatus in your church around the promotion of your life, your brand, your image, your books, your work, your quote ministry, whatever. And that is just anathema. And honestly, I, I just more and more kind of think that pastors should just not be famous. It's hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. Part of me says like, just none of us should ever put anything on the internet and uh, should go the opposite direction. The other part of me thinks about Tim Keller and uh, who's a household name in much of the West. Is he a celebrity? I don't know. It's the farthest thing from his personality. Nobody had ever really heard of him outside of New York till he was in his fifties or later. And I am extraordinarily grateful. I'm not even reformed and I've just still so benefited from his life his writings, his work. I think of Dallas Willard. I think of N.T. Wright. Some of these like voices, I think of Ruth Haley Barton. And then all of, of course, the, the ancients and the mystics that I've been reading for so many years down through church history. My life would be impoverished if I did not have access mm. to them. And not just the dead ones, the living ones help us navigate our cultural moment. You know, there's so many ancients that I love and they're beautiful, but they're not going to help me figure out how to deal with the culture war between left and right and the rise of the internet and social media. And so to have some living saints in training, sages in training, you know, so that's where, I don't know. I mean, I would, I'd love to hear you speak to that actually, because I think it's an open <laughs> question in my mind. Um, it's an open question in my mind. I have the way I'm not famous by any stretch of the imagination. A, a number of people read my book and so on and so forth. And I have developed my, uh, it's a moving target, but my kind of way of being in the world that intentionally mitigates against all of that mm -hmm. and grounds me in um, relationship, in people, in real life, in a church, in a local community, in serving. Um, and so I have the stuff that I'm doing, but I'm learning as I go, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
I, you know, I, I, first I'd love of to all, hear your thoughts. Well, <laughs> I don't know that I have a lot of profound thoughts on this. I, I'm not a celebrity, nor am I the son of a celebrity. Uh, but I can imagine it's an incredible challenge. And like you just said, I personally don't want you to stop writing books because I've benefited from them <laughs> personally. Uh, but I'm sure it is a it is a temptation. And you know, this sounds weird. I think one of the uh, potential beauties of the internet is that it has a democratizing power. And so uh, one thing that can happen on the internet is that you get people who uh, speak to niches. You know, they're able to connect with a particular kind of person and they're not a celebrity because they don't have a ton of people following them, but they've connected with right. that group of people who they can really shepherd and care for and love. And that's been one of my prayers for the internet is that we would see uh, almost the the kind of mega pastor thing die all of a sudden where, you know, you're talking to someone, have you read this book? No, I've never even heard of that guy. Awesome. But have you read my guy? Oh yeah, my guy is over here. Have you read my gal? Yeah, she's right. I, I would love to see that universe develop and happen. Yes. I don't think we'll ever leave behind those few people who are, you know, kind of mega names that everybody knows about. But I, I do wonder if there's a future in Christianity for, uh, fewer celebrities and more voices coming to the table in a really healthy way. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, we will, uh, see. Um, I, th I think that question, I wish I had the, like, here's the, here's the answer. Here's the, here's my slam dunk. But it's like, what's the real key line, the poet, we must live the questions. Mm. And I think, you know, the, this tragedy is, in most of the examples we would offer of kind of celebrity Christian pastor gone wrong, they were not living that question. They, they were intentionally pursuing. building and pursuing and building a ministry around the pursuit of that, often in some kind of a justification to reach more people or mm. to grow the church or to whatever. And, um, I don't know of a lot of examples, I'm sure they're out there, of celebrity Christian pastor scandal kind of fall where the person was attempting, like Eugene Peterson was their model for ministry or <laughs> D Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Dallas Willard yeah. or, you know what I mean? And they're just like, how do I stay grounded? Should I be getting rid of social media entirely? How do I stay yeah. faithful to my church? Who's the authority over me? Who am I confessing sin to? Who has access to my finances? Who's helping me decide how I spend my time, what invitations I say yes to? I don't think those are the kinds of questions that were being asked. Hmm. And so I don't know that we, I, I don't have the answers, at least not yet, but I, I know those are the questions I want to be asking. Well, those are good questions. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're asking them. And I hope that it sets a healthy model. You know, every generation is going to have its issues, but I, I do hope that uh, millennials and, and maybe Gen Z will have a little more sobriety about <laughs> what it means to be a celebrity so, leader man. in the church. We've seen so many people fall. And that sad in itself. I think the thing that that podcast we're both been listening to highlights, though, is that it's not just them that fall. There are, there are lives that become collateral damage. The collateral process. damage. And it's, and it's touching on people's faith in God, the deepest part of who mm -hmm. they are. So yeah, all I know is this. I'm doing a bunch of interviews right now because I have a book coming out. And then on October 21st, I am going on a year long uh, sabbatical. Half of it, I'll still be working, but nothing public. You won't hear or see anything from me at all for a year. So, <laughs> and that might sink my writing career. And at this point, I'm okay with that. I just want to try to be a grand. That's amazing. I'm just jealous of your year long sabbatical. <laughs> yes. I won't ask life, you where you're life. going so people won't go seeking after you. Life goal. It's one of those Irish caves, right? You're <laughs> you're holding up. That's in there. right. Skellig Michael or some, uh -huh. something. Crazy. <laughs> no. Well, again, I, I appreciate you taking the time to to talk with me, and I'm glad that uh, you are are writing and helping Christians walk in some of these practices. Your new book, uh, "Live No Lies." I haven't gotten to finish it all the way because I just got it a few days ago. But what I've read so far, which is a good chunk, I've really enjoyed, and I think again, you crystallized a lot of my experiences. And to press it even one step further. Uh, you know, you talk about the world, the flesh and the devil. And, and those are things that I think a lot of people hear in Christian culture, but we have these uh, bizarre caricature versions of it. It's like, you know, it, you think that 
I would put it this way. I once heard a, a little kid who uh, said that he wanted to get a job at NASA and his qualifications were men in black and Gal uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. He'd watch those movies. And I think that's what we think about the devil. And they're like, yeah, I've watched The Exorcist and The Conjuring. So I, you know, I would say I know yes. a lot about this stuff. And I think you, you are offering one of the more mature takes I've read in recent memory of what it looks like to have the right enemies and to understand them correctly and not have these uh, weird caricature versions. So I would just encourage you, if you're listening to this, to go check out that book uh, and make sure not to try to read Shout out to John Mark in a few months because he's going to be gone. You won't be able to find him. <laughs> <laughs> well, reach out all you want. I will have no idea. <laughs> he just won't know. Thanks so much for being on the show. It's an honor to come along. <laughs> and peace to all that you are and all that you're doing. Awesome. Awesome.